as we look at 2 Kings chapter 23, I would take a moment and say, I do think that we have a generation. I'm, I'm not here to say that there's not been this same issue or similar issue that's existed um, throughout probably every generation to some extent. Could be social media, could be um, the fact that the whole world is right at our fingertips constantly. It seems to me that in a heightened way, this is something I want to talk to you about um, today because there is this um, ideology where people are um, pursuing what they would call their truth. I'm trying to find my truth. I'm on a journey to find my truth. There's really no such thing as the truth. There's just my truth, what's, what's the truth for me. And I'm not so concerned with the culture and the world and those who don't know the Lord, um, how they're influenced with this uh, type of thinking. But I am concerned with those who are in the church because there is even more so than what I can remember this uh, idea why I know the Bible says and I know that the scripture says and I know that the church history says and I know these things, but I think this and I feel this way about it. And so I want to dig into that. When I became a Christian 30 years ago, I had never heard John 3, 16. I didn't know of David and Goliath. I did not have a, a Bible background, a church background in the way that um, I guess that we, we would consider a church background as something that's really integral to your daily life. And when I got saved, they gave me a Bible. Did you know this is, this is true? This is actually a true thing. The church I became a Christian in that I got saved in um, that the pastor of that church, him and his wife, um, attend church with us online. I, they live in New Mexico. They attend church with us. Uh, I get texts from him, you know, every now and then. And so Ken and Pat Willard, God bless you. Thank you so much for investing in me as a young man. Uh, I had nothing to give you, but you love me. And, and they're going through the fast with us. They're going through the 100 days of prayer with us. And, um, but maybe because I didn't have the access to all the social media and you know a million different preachers that, that people have at their fingertips and all the different ways that people go at life at our fingertips, they put and they instilled in me a great value for the scriptures. They taught me um, not just to how to want to come and hear a preacher talk, but how I should also desire to discover um, God's word for myself. And so I say that to say that I would not be doing my job as a pastor if I did not speak to those who are younger or new to their faith or even those who've been serving God and, and the Bible is not a big part of your life daily. I would not be a good pastor if I did not challenge you and, and say you really are missing one of the most wonderful parts of your walk with God and that is getting to know God in a real way through his word and through the scriptures. John 8, 31 says it like this. If you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples. Not if you continue in your own way or your own thoughts or your own feelings. If you continue in my word. People say, oh, well, that's hard because I got this and I got that and I think about it like this and I think about it like that. I understand, I understand. But there's something powerful about coming underneath the authority of his word where you say in humility, God, the, the, the Bible actually says it like this in 1 John 2, 14, that you can be strong because the word of God abides in you and that's how you overcome the evil one. You don't overcome evil and temptation uh, by your own strength. You become strong because you let his word abide in you. And no matter what your struggle is, we all need his word to give us strength so we can overcome. Philippians 2.16 says, I hold fast to the word of life so that I will not run in vain. 
So there's a priority that the scripture puts on scripture. And so 2 Kings 23, verse 17, the king asked, this is speaking of the King Josiah, he asked this question, what is that tombstone I see? What is that tombstone I see? And the people of the city said to Josiah, it marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things that you have done to it. Josiah said to leave it alone. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. And that's what I wanna talk to you about. Don't disturb the bones. Do not disturb. So they spared his bones and those of the prophet who had come from Samaria. I want to to use that, that story, and I'll give you the backstory of it briefly, to talk to you on that question and that command. What is that tomb that I see? And don't disturb his bones. Don't disturb his bones. Now, the story here is Josiah has just become king in the nation of Judah. Now, this is significant because he's only eight years of age. He's the youngest king in the history of of the nation of Judah and even Israel. And when he takes the throne, Israel is in a spiritual decline. Um, Significantly, it's been in great decline. The kings that have preceded Josiah, they had all... Uh, for for generations had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And so idolatry was rampant. They were serving uh, the false god of Baal and Asheroth, Baal's mom. Uh, They were serving um, the god of Molech where they would build altars to Molech and they would bring their babies, their sons and their daughters, and they would put them on the altar of Molech and basically fry their children to honor that false god. And this... This idol worship was rampant and the wickedness in Judah was rampant. And so Judah, in Judah, Josiah has a different sense about him. He has a a respect for God. And the Bible actually says, like David did. So he has a sense of, of the God that David served. At a young age, he could look past the kings that had preceded him. And there was something about David that had jumped over all of those evil kings and had touched the heart of Josiah. And Josiah is cleaning up the city of Jerusalem and specifically he's cleaning up the the temple where God had been worshiped. It was in shambles. It it was uh, vandalized and broken down. The, The scripture even says that the book of the law had been lost. So imagine it's a church with no Bible. It's not that hard to imagine uh, because they're all over the place. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on. Um, Well, that was maybe a little rough. Okay, hang on. (laughs) And so Josiah instructs Shaphan, who is a scribe, who kind of acts as his right-hand man, and uh, Hilkiah, the priest, to go and restore and cleanse uh, the temple and get it fixed back up and you know, get, get the walls painted and get the carpet replaced. Come on, you make it look decent, right? Just try to get the stuff together. And, and as they're going through the, the, the rubble and they're fixing different things, they go down into a chamber and there in that chamber is a, a treasure chest and locked within that treasure chest is, is not gold or silver or, or some precious jewel, but in that treasure chest is an old book and they pull out the old book, they dust it off, and they discover that that's the book of the law, and they open the book of the law, and they begin to read it, and Shaphan, the scribe, begins to translate what the Bible there says, and as he begins to read it, he recognizes the name of Josiah in the text from 1 Kings chapter 13. And so they take this book of the law to the king, to Josiah. They tell him the story that as they were restoring the temple, they, they stumbled upon this chest and they found the book of the law. And as they were reading the book of the law, they discovered something that they felt that he would be interested in. And so they begin to read the text from 1 Kings chapter 13 
to Josiah. And it mentions specifically uh, that a king will be born in Judah. His name will be Josiah. He'll be eight years of age. And as Josiah is hearing them read this ancient text, he's acknowledging that the text is talking about me. Where did you get this? How old is this book? Who wrote this book? Who, how could anyone possibly know that I'm the only king that's ever been in Israel by the name of Josiah? No one's ever taken the throne at the age of eight in the nation of Judah. Who could have possibly known this? Who could have wrote this? And they're reading a prophecy that's 326 years old. 326 years before Josiah came on the planet, a prophet, a man of God came from Judah and he prophesied to Jeroboam, an evil king, that God was gonna raise up a godly young man in the nation of Judah. And he said, as confirmation to this prophecy, the altar that you're offering these false sacrifice, these sacrifices to false gods on is going to split in half. And as he said it, the altar split in half and Jeroboam, angry as a king that anyone would defy him, said to arrest that man of God and let's kill him. And as he sticks his hand out, his hand withers up. And then the king decides, well, maybe I should be a little bit more careful with this guy. And so he kind of warms up to the man of God, says, hey, I'm sorry about that. Didn't mean that. Didn't really want to kill you. Could you pray for me that my hand would be okay? And so he prays for him and restores his hand. And Josiah hears that story. That story is read. He tears his clothes, which represents he repents. He cries out to God for direction uh, what he is to do. He surrounds himself with some spiritual advisors, which includes Shaphan and Hilkiah, and also includes a prophet by the name of Huldah. And they tell him that he is to follow exactly what that prophet, that man of God had said he is, he is to do to clean up the wickedness of his nation. And so Josiah begins to go through Jerusalem and he's cleaning up the city from He's tearing down the high places and the altars that were built to all these false gods. And he's cleaning the nation. And he's even going to the extreme that he's going into tombs that are in the mountainside, in, in, a, in, in the hillside. And he's taking the bones out of the tombs that are the bones of the priests that had misled God's people and the nation of Israel to this idol worship. And there's prophets and there's all these ungodly leaders that have deceived God's people and the nation of Israel into this idol worship. And so he's going into the tombs and he's crushing the bones. He's, he's wiping the, the idol worship, not just in present day, but he's getting rid of any sign of this idol worship. And as he's doing this, he comes upon a tomb that looks different. We don't know why it looks different. We don't have any details behind why it looks different, but something about this tomb that he comes upon is different from all the other tombs. I have my sneaking suspicion that it was because all the other tombs were regularly visited because they were the, the tombs of the priests and the prophets that, that were their influence in the nation to idol worship. And because idol worship was still a, a big thing, they, they were going and visiting these tombs and maybe putting flowers and decorations to honor these past priests and prophets. We don't know the details, but it seems to me that maybe there was something about those tombs that, that, that stood out, and then he gets to the tomb that, that, is, is, that is different, and maybe it's overgrown, maybe it's not visited, maybe there's no one going to that tomb. And whatever it is, he knows, Josiah knows, that there's a reason why all these idol worshipers are staying away from this tomb. There's a reason why they're avoiding it. There's a reason why they're drawn to this one and this one and this one, but they're not drawn to this one. And that piques the curiosity of the young king and he says, what is this tombstone I see? What is this tombstone that I see? What I want you to notice is Josiah is a new generation leader. I want you to notice that Josiah is moving the nation in a new direction. 
that a spiritual awakening is happening in Israel, that, that a revival is sweeping through the nation of Judah. And as all of this is going on, this young king has the wherewithal, the wisdom and the insight to pause and stop and say, before I go any further, I have to ask a question about this tombstone. I have to ask a question about our history, about our heritage. I have to ask a question about God's people's history and what is it that, that God has done historically through his people because I need to go back and learn how God's moved in the past. It's not that God's not moving in a fresh way with me, but I can't move in a new way with go back, uh, going back and learning a little bit more about the old way. And so he goes back and he says, what is this tombstone that I see? And they begin to say, oh, this is, this is the man of God. This, this is the guy that 326 years ago prophesied to Jeroboam that God was going to raise up a young king in Israel by the name of Josiah. You, king, this is the grave. This is the tomb of the man of God who prophesied your birth your reign as king, your mission, your purpose, and your destiny. Could you imagine being Josiah? Imagine. You're standing on the grave of the man who God would use to speak about your life, your destiny, your mission, your purpose, and your call. You're standing on his tomb, and you're, you're standing there at the bones of the man who's changed your life and is changing the direction of a nation. What must that have been like? To think back, I'm standing at the place where a man 326 years ago was somehow so close to the creator of the universe that he would allow that God to speak through him about my life today and now. What must that have been like? So he says this, don't disturb those bones. All the other graves, that's fine. All the other legacies, that's fine. But this one, don't disturb it. This one, we preserve. This one, we protect. This one, we regard. This one, we cherish. This one, we, 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 we treat differently because this one has something that should endure forever. And in that moment, something powerful happens, not only with Josiah, but something powerful happens with a young man that is there. This is how the baton is passed from one generation to another in the kingdom of God. If you were to go to Jeremiah chapter 26 and fast forward there, you would know that at this point, the Josiah generation has done what it could do. And now that generation is gone. It's died. And the Hilkiahs are, are gone. The, the Shaphans, those spiritual advisors that had surrounded Josiah, that generation is gone. That generation's job is done. They're not on the planet anymore. And God's raised up the Jeremiah generation. And now Jeremiah is, is the fiery prophet that's doing the same thing that Josiah did to his generation. Now Jeremiah is preaching to his generation about turning to God and, and honoring God and, and to doing what God says and to turn away from idolatry and idol. Work. And, and he's doing that. And it's so troubling the conscience of his generation that they go to Jeremiah and they arrest him, they imprison him, and they sentence him to death. And as Jeremiah is on death row, they're, he's awaiting his execution. They're trying to determine the exact way they're going to kill the prophet and the exact timing of his death. And as they're discussing this, a young man enters the courtroom by the name of Ahiakam, who verse 24 of Jeremiah 26 says is the son of Shaphan. He's the son of the man who was there with Josiah when he heard the book of the law. He was there with Josiah as they hear from the prophet Huldah 
what their mission was to be. Shaphan was there. Hilkiah was there. And if you read the text, one of the things that Shaphan did that's so interesting is he brought his son along with him, his little boy along with him, Ahiakim. And Ahiakim came with them as they're cleaning up the, the nation, as they're getting rid of all the altars and, and they're, they're doing all these things. And he was there when Josiah looks at the tomb and says, what is this tombstone that I see? And he's there as he hears the story that they told Josiah about the man of God who 326 years earlier had prophesied his life and his purpose. And he was there when Josiah is having that moment with God, the realization that, that he was sent by God, assigned by God to the planet at that time in the earth to do something great for God. And he hears Josiah say, don't disturb the bones. And now fast forward that Josiah generation is gone. The Jeremiah generation is on the earth. And now the word of God is also being threatened. Now the, 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 the life of God and what God is wanting to say, how God is wanting to speak is being threatened. And now, in the same way that Josiah stands up and says, don't disturb the bones, Ahiakim walks into that courtroom, and the Bible says he supports Jeremiah, and they throw out the court case, and Jeremiah, not only does he live, but he continues to go on and be a prophet and speak for God to his generation. And what I want you to see is that Every generation has to have someone that will say, you don't disturb the bones. You see, bones are the structure of the body. Bones are the foundation of the body. You cannot have a body without bones. And the scripture, when it speaks of bones, it's symbolic of this book, of God's word. It's symbolic of truth. And so in serving God, what we learn is there are some things that are temporal. You go to a grave after very long, the, the flesh is gone, the organs are gone, the, the, but, but the bones are there because the bones represent something that's eternal. They represent things that don't change. They represent things that are the same yesterday, today, and forever. These are the non-negotiables. These are the absolutes. These are the inherencies of God. And they're bones you do not disturb. They're sacred. They're divine. And throughout all generations, there are bones that God teaches each generation. You do not disturb these bones. Deuteronomy says that you do not add or take away from this book. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19, warns of adding or taking away from the prophecy there, that if you add to it, the Bible says God will add to you the plagues that were in that book, and if you take away from it, he'll take away from you your name in that holy city. Psalms 119 the psalmist discusses how we're to look at this book, and he says, you love it. You respect it. You regard it. Verse after verse about cherishing it, studying it, delighting in the bones. When Moses would die, the Bible says in Jude chapter, Jude verse 9, that Satan would actually come down and he would contend for the bones of Moses. Why would Satan want anything to do with bones? Because Moses' bones were very powerful and the devil was in a battle with the archangel Michael over those bones. The Bible actually says that the bones of Moses were so powerful in Deuteronomy chapter 34, God came down and grabbed the body of Moses and he buried, God himself buried the body of Moses because God was saying, you don't disturb those bones. You don't touch those bones. Elisha was dead, nothing but bones in an old tomb. And they grab a soldier and just kind of not really sure what to do because they're under a threat by a, an incoming army. They take the dead body of a soldier and they throw it in the tomb, not knowing that Elisha's bones are in there. And when the soldier hits the body, the dead body of the soldier hits the bones of Elisha, he comes back to life. In Ezekiel, God would take the prophet over a valley and he would ask him, what do you see? And he would say, I see a valley filled with dry bones. 
And God would say, I want you to prophesy to those bones. I want you to prophesy to that which has been and gone before you. And God can bring it back to life and he can stand it back up on its feet again. The Passover lamb, of course, was what God had given Israel to celebrate the fact that God would cause death and destruction to pass over God's people's homes. And when he said, you eat the Passover lamb, you are to eat all of it. You're to leave not one bit of it, not eaten. But then in Numbers 9, 12, he says, but don't break any of its bones. Don't disturb the bones. I'm going somewhere with this. Jesus is also now dying on the cross, who is, of course, our perfect final Passover lamb. And the Bible is clear that they did not break any of his bones. We have explicit details of the way Jesus would suffer and die, the way that they would beat his body, the way that, that they would rip the flesh from his back, um, the way that he, they would beat his face, the way that they would nail, of course, his, his, his wrists and his feet to the cross, and that the, the suffering and the beating was so savage towards Christ that the Bible says he didn't even look like a human being. He looked more like an animal. But in all of those beatings and every, every um, beating he endured, not one bone was broken which is quite miraculous. Because it was a priority to God to not disturb the bones. You could go to the crucifixion scene and you could go to the thief on the left who we would know represents Lucifer who had f fallen from heaven. And we know that because he there hanging on the cross offers the same insult towards Christ that the devil offered towards Jesus in the desert, and that was, if you really are the Son of God. And that thief's legs were broken to accelerate his death. And immediately the soldiers went from that cross to the soldier on the right, who we would know represents Adam, because Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that word paradise is the same word as Eden. And that soldier we know, uh, representing Adam, Adam fell from temptation and he left paradise because of his fall. And so that soldier's legs were broken. And then the soldiers come to Jesus and they're there to break his legs like they broke the thief and the criminal on the right and the one on the left's legs. But the Bible says the soldier does something unknowingly that would fulfill Psalms 22, and that's the prophecy that none of the Messiah's bones will be broken. And instead of breaking his legs, he goes and he pierces his side, not knowing he's fulfilling Psalms 22 and the prophecy that none of his bones will be broken. You see, unlike the thief on the left, Jesus never fell from heaven. And unlike the thief and the criminal on the right, Jesus in no way, shape, or form ever fell into temptation. He came down from paradise and he overcame all temptation. He came down willingly. He gave his life willingly. He became a human being willingly and he laid it down for us. And so they would pierce his side, and blood and water would come out. And we would know that to have a birth, it has to have blood and water. And so when the soldier pierced Jesus' side and blood and water came out, in the same way that God would reach into Adam's side, pull out the rib and create Eve, Adam's bride, when blood and water flowed out of Christ's side, God would reach into him and create the church, which is the bride of Christ. So we take, I'm showing, I'm showing you something, if you'll just watch it for just one more second. So they take the body of Jesus off the cross and they lay it in a tomb. And three days later, the tomb becomes a womb. 
and the very first person to come out of the tomb that became a womb, we know, would become the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ. When a baby is born, the first thing to come out of the body is the head. You're in trouble if it's a feet first baby. The head comes out first. You know what they call that? When the head comes out, they call it crowning. So when Jesus came out of the tomb that had become a womb as the head of the church, they crowned him. God crowned him with all power and authority to be the head of the church. And then after the head comes the shoulders, which was the apostles. And then comes the arms, which is the early church fathers. And then comes the torso, which was the saints of old and the prophets and the, the, the generations that would come after that. And then came the hips and the legs, which would represent the John Wesleys and the Calvins and the Martin Luthers and all the men of God that had, had been raised up and the generations of old. Maybe it's your great grandma, or your great grandfather, your mom or your dad. The, the saints of old, maybe they all, the Billy Grahams of the world, they represent the ankles uh, that, 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 that had gone before us. And then, then you finally, finally, when the baby's completely out, the feet are last, which is us. That represents us. We're the feet generation. And we know this because all the generations who have gone before us, they're no longer touching earth. The feet, gravity forces the feet to touch the earth. We're the feet generation because we're still here. And we carry the head, and we carry the shoulders, and we carry that which has gone before us, and we cherish that which has gone before us, and we care for that which has gone before us, and the Bible says what every generation has to be careful of is that one part of the body doesn't say to another part of the body, we don't need you. The, 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 this generation can't go back and say to that generation, ah, oh, we don't need you no more. We're gonna do it our own way. We're gonna, we're gonna do it a better way. Every generation has to come to a place where they look back and they say, I appreciate the new move. I appreciate what God wants to do through us in our generation and our future. But I've got to take a moment, pause and stop and go back and ask the question, what has gone before me? How has God moved in past generations? How has God moved his historically? And I've got to honor that as I move forward. You see, the point is we're all connected. You don't disturb that. And this book is what contains the bones. Notice when Josiah goes and he asks about the tombstone, they don't teach him about the specifics of what makes up a bone. They talk to him about a person because the point wasn't to get Josiah to know that there are bones there. The point was to get to know the person that had been a part of carrying the message to his generation. And because he was faithful to do it to his generation, now that enabled Jeremiah to carry it to his. And so it was to get Jeremiah. And so the purpose of you getting to know the bones is not for the bones' sake. It's not so you can know this is a sin and that's a sin and this is wrong and that's wrong and I should do this and I shouldn't do that. It's to get to know the person of Jesus Christ who loves you and wants a relationship with you. Really the point of the Bible, that is the point of the Bible. If you, if you didn't know the point of the Bible is it's really the point is to show you of how a God that created us desires a relationship with us and pursues us and has always pursued us in spite of us. And so the goal of loving the scriptures and reading the scriptures and asking God to speak to you through the scriptures is relationship. I would say that part of disturbing the bones would be, you could do it many, many ways, but one of the ways to disturb the bones that, that I see happen sometimes in church life is we underemphasize the point of the scriptures. The point is to introduce us to a relationship with God. 
The point of the scriptures is not to point out what's wrong with everybody, right? Oh, well, uh, you know, I heard that they, they're an alcoholic. How can they, can they be a Christian? I don't know. They got a drinking problem. Oh, that, that one over there, uh, this, there's this. And that one over there is gay. And that one over there is this. And that one over there has uh, got an abortion. And that, that, uh, how can they be in church? They shouldn't be able to be in church. Don't they know you can't, can't have that God thing because of that? When the point of Scripture, the point of Scripture is that God is pursuing a relationship with us of all kinds of us, with all kinds of different flaws. And the truth is, he shouldn't with any of us. Okay, he just shouldn't. And when you start pointing out that you should and someone else shouldn't, you're disturbing the bones, by the way. You're disturbing the bones. What you should say is, hey, listen, there's probably a lot of things that it says, don't do this, don't do that, that you're gonna have to ask God to work on your heart in those, those things because they're specific to your leanings and they're specific to maybe the way the enemies uh, worked on you and cultures worked on you and your family and your upraising or all kinds of things may be working on you in that way. But guess what? There's some things as I go to it's working on me too. It's talking to me about some things that I wish it wasn't talking to me about. All kinds of things I wish it just, the Bible would blink at that when it comes to me, but it doesn't blink at that with me either. Amen. But what I know is I'm learning how a relationship with God through the scriptures, is God, through my relationship with him, will begin to say, hey, this area of your life, it's time to maybe let me work on that area. I got something better for you. You picked that up in culture. You were abused. You, you, I'm, I'm sorry, the culture is just, was just too dominant in, in your life and it influenced you too much and it, it, and it lied to you and it's deceived you and it's blinded you. It's, it's, it, it's, it, I've, I've got something greater for you. I've got something higher for you and, and I want to show you how I can free you from the things that the enemy has used to lie to you about those things. And the point is, is we, we encourage people to go to scripture and we encourage people to dig into scripture, not to find out what's wrong with them, but we encourage them to do it so they can have a relationship with a God that in each of our lives knows how to personally do the surgery on us, right? The word of God is living and it's sharp and it's more powerful than a two-edged sword, but that two-edged sword is not used to cut people's heads off, right? Jesus rebuked Peter when he used the sword to cut the guy's ear off, right? And Jesus healed the guy's ear. What's he saying? Hey, the, the sword is not used to destroy people. The sword is not used to cut people. The sword is used by God to do surgery on people so he can heal them and make them stronger and healthier as a result of his work. Oh, uh, there's a church I used to pastor that would have loved that. <laughs> Don't disturb the bones. There is something that tries to keep you and I away from loving and cherishing and having a regular relationship with the scriptures. There is something, I, and I'm trying to get to something about that. Have you ever met somebody that um, somebody introduced you, you didn't know this person, you had never known this person before, but the person that introduced this person to you maybe had told them about you? And now you meet them and, and you're hearing that you almost feel like a closeness, like you've known them for a long time, even though you just met them, but, but you're connecting the dots. It's because of what this friend of yours has told them about you guys. And now you seem to know stories and things about one another, where they work, who they are, where they're from, with their favorite football team, all this stuff you seem to know, even though you've never met them, you know about them through somebody else. 
And then as great as that is many times, sometimes you have the unfortunate experience where you meet someone through someone that you've never met before. And maybe um, you can pick up on the fact that the things that that person told them about you were not so good. And immediately that person is maybe shutting down on you, being cold on you, being awkward with you, being hesitant with you, maybe not even interested in you, not because they know you, but because of what someone they, they know told them about you. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody else live life, okay? <laughs> and so sometimes people avoid the church and they're hurt by church and they avoid the scriptures and they avoid these things and they have all these questions that, that precede relationship. Like if I'm gonna have a relationship with God, I need to know, does it say this and does it say that and what about this and what about that? It's not how you pursue a relationship with God. You just decide, I want to get to know him. And, 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 and I'm gonna trust that as I get to know him and through relationship, I need to make the call for myself. Right? And so some of you, I'm here to challenge you to be willing to take the time to stop and pause and not just be carried by the culture and not just be carried by the, the popular trends of our day about things like truth and about the gospel and about these bones that we're to, to honor and to cherish. Not because I'm asking you to, but because there's a God in heaven that desires to have a relationship with you. And one of the best ways he can form that relationship with you is not by you just going to others to hear about this God, but is to open up this book and say, God, I want to get to know you myself. And would you speak to me about me? And would you speak to me about life? And would you speak to me about friends and relationships? Would you speak to me about culture? Would you speak to me about decisions? Would you speak to me about you and who you are? Would you, would you spend, as I open up this book, would you talk to me about these things? Jonathan Edwards said, let not this treasure lie by you neglected. It's the word of God. The phrase there is interesting because word actually translates breath. When you hear someone say, this is the word of God, word speaks of breath, which is what Timothy actually said, or Paul told Timothy that this is inspired or God breathed and know this, that every single part of this book was God breathed and God did not waste his breath. The Bible is something that you should pick up and every time you turn to a passage, you're meant to hear, thus says the Lord to me. When you read this book and the scripture speaks, you should know it's God speaking to me. And you should also know that God speaks to each generation in that generation's ways. God never asked, if you are consistent with the scripture, God never asked one generation to go back and do everything like the previous generation because God is always moving. What he does is he says, I want you to go back and learn from that generation what they did and I want you to maintain anything that is consistent and faithful with the scriptures. And then I want you to let God move through you to your generation in a way that can be effective to your generation, but honor and not disturb the bones. Every new move of God as it unfolds should pause and consider what has the church always believed? The Bible has always had primacy. It's always had the final decision and all things have their final rest with scripture and there is a reason for that. And the reason isn't to be old school and the reason isn't to be irrelevant and the reason isn't to be uneducated and not intellectual and not a thinker and, and, and a mental midget. That's not the point of it. Martin Luther said in his work, The Bondage of the Will, that Satan has used un unsubstantial spectres. I looked that up. And it means, in essence, Satan has used a fake boogeyman. 
So that little boogeyman under the bed with your kids that they get all worried about, that little boogeyman in the closet that you have to tell them, don't worry about it. The bo- it's, there's no boogeyman. Martin Luther said that Satan uses a fake boogeyman to scare men and women off of reading the sacred text. This is the reason, to poison the church. Well, I know that that's what they say, the Bible says, but I feel this and I think that. No, it's not our job. It's not our job. Our job is to humble ourselves and say, you know what? I'm the feet and I'm not gonna say to this part of the body, I don't need you. And the body of Christ is 2,000 years old and I gotta honor the head and I've gotta honor the shoulders and I've gotta honor the early church leaders and I've gotta honor those who've gone before me. And yes, I'm gonna let God do a new thing in me, but not without stopping and pausing and considering the way God has always worked. And this is the bottom line. Satan hates this book. Satan hates these bones. Satan will do anything he can to talk you and I out of loving and cherishing these bones. He'll do everything he can to scare us away from it, tell us we'll never understand it, we'll never get it. That's for just the super spiritual people. That's for the overly religious. That's, that's, that's you know, you know that's, that's the Jesus freak stuff. You know, listen, Satan does not want you in the book because he knows who it will introduce you to. He knows that through this book, you can have a thriving, close relationship with the God who breathed on those who wrote it. You see, the bones may not look like much, but if God will breathe on them as you read it, you'll find yourself maybe even experiencing more might than a fierce army. It's amazing to me to watch it. I watch it all the time, how how. Someone dead in their sin can walk into a church service and they didn't even know when they were walking in, but they touched those bones and resurrection life changes everything they've ever known. It's amazing to me. Because this is not an ordinary book. In this book are the bones of our faith, the bones of truth, not my truth, not our truth, not a seven hills truth. Truth, eternal, never changing truth. In this book is the power of God. The Bible actually says you shouldn't even be ashamed of it because it's the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. This is a powerful book. This is a special book and their bones you do not disturb. So this is, practically speaking, what I think you can do. The Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect. It's a title for God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect for the transforming of the soul. You're not perfect, it's perfect, right? It doesn't expect you to be perfect. Doesn't need you to be perfect, it's perfect. And through its perfection, it transforms the soul. So this is the first thing that happens when it comes to having a regular diet and regular relationship with the scripture. People think, well, maybe I I still smoke cigarettes. I can't read the Bible. Y'all here? Uh, People have things in their life that are hangups that maybe even are sin and that keeps them from the scripture. Because they think, how could someone like me? How could someone that does this? How could someone that's still living with the someone they're not married to, that's obviously not God's will, right? How could someone, it's a quiet church. How could someone, what? No. I'm here to introduce you, not to that wrong of that, I'm here to introduce you to you shouldn't let that keep you from scripture. Anytime a voice tells you that you can't get into the scripture because of something that's wrong with you, I just wanna help you, that's not the voice of God. God does not care 
about what's wrong with you when it comes to going into the book. He just said, just, you know what? The more junk I got, probably the more Bible I need to be reading because it's that perfection that transforms my soul. I can't experience change if I don't get into it. I'm not, I'm not getting you a, giving you a get out of jail free card. I'm not, I'm not giving you this greasy grace, just do, live however you want and this isn't sin and that's not sin. That's not what I'm saying. It is truth, it is final, it is sure. It is immovable, it is inerrant. It is God's final authority on all things. Now that that's been said, you and I don't have to be perfect to engage it. Let its perfection transform the soul. Amen? And don't let anything keep you from the book. Don't let anything. Especially not a person. Now, so I think every person in this room can start reading the Bible immediately. I'm gonna tell you just how. Just a few little ways how. Um, they, call this, they call this stacking, by the way. All right, so here's just a little way to trick yourself into reading the Bible. Ready? Ready? Because come on, we, we got bad habits, and if you, don't, if you have a habit of not reading the Bible, that's not gonna change because I talked to you about it. It's gonna change because you tricked yourself into the habit. You know this, right? You know this is how we work, right? You, you gotta trick yourself. Trick yourself, or I, I, maybe that's the wrong word. You gotta be more creative than your old habits. So they call it stacking. Stacking just simply make, making it easy. So you wanna join the gym, right? You wanna get in shape. You don't buy a membership because it costs $8 in Blue Ash. You know that, right? You're never going to Blue Ash to work out. You know that, right? <laughs> right, you know that, huh? So you find a gym, even if it's $22, it's between your workplace and your home. You have to pass by it. You don't have to go out of your way, you gotta pass by it. That's your gym. That's the gym you join. And then you don't go home and get your clothes and then go back to the gym. No, you just fill your trunk up, just go ahead and wash a bunch of clothes, fill your trunk up with all your workout clothes for the next month or the next seven days. There are, it's always there, it's ne never leaving. If you have to put on some stinky stuff, you just do it, just do it. Doesn't matter. Come on, you're not there to pick anybody up anyway because you're saved now, okay? So that's not why you're there. <laughs> the likelihood of you making it to the gym because you force yourself to have to say no to it, right? You force yourself to say no to it. It's called stacking. So find a way to stack the, so this is, this is ways I've done it in the past, ways I've done it in the past. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I take my little K cup and I put it in my little coffee maker and I push brew. And surprisingly, that little cup of coffee takes more time than you think. <laughs> and right there, you put your Bible right there. And while it's percolating, open the Bible and you read the Bible. When it's done, you close the Bible. There you go. You stacked it, right? You don't put it in your nightstand. You put it on your pillow before you leave in the morning. So when you go home that night, before you go to bed, you have to actually take it and be like, nah, I'm not interested. You do things to help yourself. Say, it's not that hard. I don't have to do that much. I don't have to be crazy about it. I just have to open it and begin to read it. And I may not even feel change in a week or change in a month or change in, but over time, as I get that word in me, as I find the story, I'll begin to more and more see how God interacts 
with his people, how he interacted with Israel and how he's inter interacting now with the church and how he's interacting with his chosen people in the earth to accomplish his will. And I'll begin to watch how he does it. And I'll begin to watch all these little things in there like, oh, there's this woman caught in adultery and the people that catch her take the Bible and they say that the by the scripture says she should, she should be destroyed. And Jesus is like, you're disturbing the bones. You're disturbing the bones. And, and, and just to go ahead and make his point, he just says, hey, why don't we just take a minute and why don't we, why don't we point out the scriptures that you are violating real quick? I love when people love to point out something they think other people are violating. And thank God someone is not as limited in their span of understanding as that person because they would probably have twice as many scriptures to unload on that person. And then it would be this back and forth dumb argument that God never designed the scriptures to be, right? He actually says you avoid the endless arguments. That's the proof of maturity. I'm saying you get into the book to know that Jesus says that to those guys like, hey, let's go ahead and talk about scriptures you're not violating. You know what they did? They left. They just walked away. No, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good. We don't need to talk about that. And you get to see how he interacts. And you get to see how Jesus does miracles. And you get to see how he works with people. And you get to watch how he does it. Come on. Not because if you read the scripture, you don't pick your little pet favorites that you use over and over and over to beat people up or that the devil will use over and over and over to beat you up, or that the devil used through some religious person you know that used all the things that they said to you to beat you up. You'll actually get in there for yourself and you'll be like, man, God's for me. What can be against me? You'll actually get in there and be like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm God's son. I'm God's child. Like the creator of the universe, like loves me, wants a relationship with me. In spite of me, he knows my failures. He knows my flaws. He knows my hangups. And guess what he's doing? He's gonna strengthen me so I can overcome those things. He's not gonna leave me like he found me. Come on, he's given me a spirit to strengthen me, to overcome those things. Now, for those of you who have no regular habit, that's what you do. Just find a way just to get it. Doesn't have to be much. Just however long it takes to make a cup of coffee. There you go. And if you're like me, you do three or four so you can get like, you know, several chapters in just during the percolating part of the coffee. Isn't that what it's called? I think that's what they call it. Brewing. It's not percolating. That's not the right word. You're an attorney. You should know. He knows all language, which I'm sure I've slaughtered most of it. Because it's brewing. So for those of you that are in the 100 days of prayer, you have a habit of reading scripture, um, I'm gonna challenge you to do something that I'm gonna try to do. So I'm gonna try to add to my 100 days of prayer, reading through the New Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. So read through the New Testament in 27 days. So one book a day, which means the gospels are gonna be, like you're gonna have to take some time, like an hour, right? It's gonna take you some time for the first four, and then it gets easier, right? Eventually you're gonna have a day where it's like Jude, and it takes you like three seconds. And then you're gonna get to Philemon, and you're gonna take two seconds. So you're gonna, it gets easier as you go through it. But I'm gonna encourage you to do that with me if you would like to, just to, can, just to develop a love for the scripture. I got that challenge yesterday from my pastor. He said, I'm gonna challenge you to do this. I'm doing it, so I'm doing that. And so now I'm just passing that on to you. I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing if you want to with me. Amen.